The Senate Health, Education and Labor and Pensions Subcommittee on Primary Health and Retirement Security will come to order. Thank you for joining us today for the hearing, When Healthcare Becomes Wealth Care, How Corporate Greed Puts Patient Care and Providers at Risk. Thank you to Health Committee Chair Bernie Sanders uh, for the uh, assistance in putting this hearing together. And thank you especially uh, to my colleague and partner, um, Senator Warren, uh, for all of her work on um, these issues. And we're very grateful to Senate President Spilka and to uh, Speaker Mariano for hosting us here in uh, this historic State House. Uh, a special thank you to Senate President Aid uh, Jim uh, Sembrano and Ayanna Clark for all their help with preparing the auditorium for this hearing. Thank you also to Governor Healy, Massachusetts Health and Human Services Secretary Kate Walsh, state legislators, local elected officials, the Massachusetts Nurses Association, SEIU 1199, uh, AFSME, Massachusetts Medical Society, the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association, Mass Care, and the many healthcare leaders in Massachusetts for their ongoing partnership in the wake of the steward crisis. Healthcare is a sacred trust, a sacred responsibility. Health providers hold the trust of their patients in moments of fear and vulnerability. They are with us from our first days on earth to the last. And the hospitals that providers work in should and must enable them to do this work well. But Steward Healthcare, led by Dr. Ralph De La Torre, uh, Cerebus and Medical Properties Trust, and greedy corporate executives like them are failing in their responsibility to patients, providers, and communities. When Cerebus and Dr. De La Torre partnered to buy Caritas Christi in 2010, they sold themselves as saviors. W. Brett Ingersoll, the then co-head of private equity and now managing director at Cerebus, said their investment would enable providers to, quote, deliver world-class care to patients in the communities where they live. In 2014, Dr. De La Torre said his mission was to provide people with, quote, really good health care. Instead, Dr. De La Torre and Cerebus, like the mythological dog that it is named after that guards the gates of the underworld, trapped their hospitals in financial instability as the rot of their greed spread. Cerebus and Dr. De La Torre stripped the hospitals of their assets and staff and forced these hospitals to pay rent to medical properties trust on land they used to own all while they extracted billions from Massachusetts institutions to expand globally. Steward and Cerebus made millions, rejoiced in their profits, and sailed away from their responsibility to workers and patients on their luxury yachts. Meanwhile, their hospitals drowned. Steward owned hospitals in Massachusetts from Methuen to Brockton buckled under $50 million in unpaid rent to Medical Properties Trust. New England Sinai closed. In one hospital, uh, Sunjia Shida Rashid, who had just given birth, bled to death when vendors went unpaid and a medical device needed to stop the bleeding wasn't available. Across the country, in Utah, Ohio, Florida, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Texas, steward-owned hospitals are without needed supplies, cutting their services or closing their doors. Now, we are forced to clean up steward's mess. Without clear information, just last week, Optum announced their intent to purchase steward's physician group. In order to protect patient care, we must guarantee that the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission closely scrutinize the potential impacts of this deal. And despite our inquiries, Stewart insists on hiding their finances, flouting requirements set by law. Dr. Ralph De La Torre was invited here today to answer to the public 
for the decisions he made, not only as the chairman and CEO of uh, Steward, but also as a physician. His expertise afforded him legitimacy, but it also carries a responsibility, a responsibility he was acutely aware of when Steward took on the care of 2.2 million patients in the United States, including 434,000 here in Massachusetts. The stakes for his success were high when Dr. De La Torre promised to deliver really good health care, but he failed. He failed the health providers, he failed communities, he failed to show up here today to answer even the most basic questions about what he has done. Dr. De La Torre's chair is as empty as the promises he made to the public. And we are going to not stop until we get the answers from uh, Dr. Lee De La Torre for the people of Massachusetts. But this story goes far beyond Steward Healthcare. A $33 billion deal by Bain, Colbert, Kravis, Roberts, and Merrill Lynch to buy Hospital Corporation of America Healthcare in 2006 showed greedy corporate executives that there was money to be made off of hospitals. HCA, now a publicly traded company, laid the groundwork for a playbook that others have followed. Joel Friedman of Paladin Healthcare, a private equity firm, promised to, quote, sustain and enhance clinical programs when Paladin purchased Hanneman Hospital in Philadelphia. Instead, they closed the hospital while private equity retained the valuable hospital real estate. Dr. Mark Bell of Pipeline Health, a private equity-backed health system, promised high-quality care when they purchased Westlake Hospital and Weiss Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Weeks later, Pipeline closed Westlake Hospital and sold Weiss Memorial's parking lot to a real estate developer. HCA's CEO, Sam Hazen, has said that HCA aims to, quote, care for and improve human life. In a year when nearly 80% of health workers and staff said that they had seen patient care jeopardized by short staffing, HCA made $60 billion in revenue. Corporate executives like these deploy promises for a profit. They believe their sacred responsibility is not to patients, it is to their bottom line. But healthcare isn't an oil change franchise or a coffee brand. A broken healthcare promise could cause communities their lives and livelihoods. And it is insufficient to simply replace one for-profit company with another, like Steward for Optum, without assurances. And that is why I'm announcing a new agenda that provides for stronger oversight of corporate greed, building a system that guarantees health care for all, and preventing stewards' failures from becoming America's health care standard. This includes my new legislation, the Health Over Wealth Act, which would protect every patient and provider that private equity touches. First, the Health Over Wealth Act would protect patients and providers. It would mandate that private equity companies set aside funding to protect access to care, remove tax breaks that incentivize companies to strip hospital assets, and give a bigger voice to workers and patients to review and block deals that would impact patient care, access, or safety. And second, the Health Over Wealth Act would guarantee transparency. Stewards' refusal to disclose their financial information maximized the harm they inflicted on communities. This bill would require that for-profit companies report on their finances, real estate deals, and how much their investors and shareholders are getting paid. They must also report on worker retention, staffing ratios, and how much their care is costing patients. And third, the Health Over Wealth Act would demand accountability. Cerebus made more than $800 million in profit. Dr. De La Torre is still sailing on his yacht. Medical Properties Trust owns health uh, property across the country. 
The Health Over Wealth Act would give the Federal Department of Health and Human Services the tools to prohibit private equity investments by companies engaging in price gouging, understaffing, or creating barriers to care, and to block real estate deals that destabilize health care systems. And that's just a start. The strongest protections will come from elevating the voices of patients, providers, and communities. And that is why I posted a discussion draft of my Health Over Wealth Act on my website. And we would appreciate any public comment on that legislation. Little did Ralph Waldo Emerson know when he wrote in 1860, the first wealth is health, that a force as greedy and pernicious as Stewart would take it literally, using our healthcare system as a cash cow to line their pockets and those of their investors. What they did was immoral, and we need to make sure that it becomes illegal. Together, we will guarantee every American a health care system, not a wealth care system. That is what the hearing today is all about, and that is why I'm so proud to be joined uh, with my great um, partner um, uh, and uh, leader on this and so many uh, other issues, uh, Senator Warren. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Markey, and a very special thank you to you for holding this hearing. I appreciate the work you're doing and the leadership on this. You are, as always, a wonderful partner here. So I've been warning about the dangers of private equity for years. Uh, in industry after industry after industry, when private equity marches in, a few wealthy investors see an opportunity to turn a quick buck. They buy a business, they load it up with debt, they strip out the assets, and then they sell it off. They take the money and run, leaving a hollowed out shell behind. Stores get closed, consumers get cheated, workers get laid off, pensions get raided. When private equity gets hold of health care providers, it is literally a matter of life and death. <clears throat> One example, when private equity firms buy up nursing homes, they cut costs to the bone, they reduce staff and suck money out the door to boost investor profits. Quality of care declines. During the pandemic, private equity owned nursing homes had a 40% higher COVID mortality rate than other nursing homes. I will say it bluntly. Turning private equity loose in our healthcare system kills people. Steward Healthcare is a clear cut case of private equity exploiting for profit healthcare. Investors looted the hospital and got rich, while nurses, doctors, and other workers tried hard to provide care. Supplies ran out, and contractors walked away because they weren't getting paid. Investors got rich while communities struggled with the reality that they might lose access to reliable health care. Stewart was created when a private equity firm, Cerebus Capital Management, bought a small nonprofit hospital system, Caritas Christi. Six years later, Cerebus sold the land and hospital buildings, the operating rooms, the nursery for the babies, the gift shop, the parking lots, to a real estate investment trust called Medical Properties Trust, or MPT, for one and a quarter billion dollars. What did private equity do with the money from that sale? Did they upgrade the operating room equipment or modernize the nursery? Nope. Private equity paid themselves hundreds of millions of dollars. Meanwhile, the hospitals now had to make huge rent payments to MPT. Not enough money was coming in, and Steward fell behind on bills everywhere. Steward's fate was pretty much sealed at that point. It was economically dead, a zombie. But that news wasn't public yet. The private equity guys knew it, of course, but they had their money, and they were off on their yachts sipping pina coladas. Now the entire system could collapse. There is one and only one thing of value that private equity hasn't already taken, Steward's Physician Group. 
Now, Optum, a subsidiary of the conglomerate United Health Group, wants to buy that last asset. Optum may be willing to pay Stewart hundreds of millions of dollars, but the deal provides no guarantee that the hospitals would stay open, none. In fact, the money could go into Stewart and right back out the door again to corporate lenders or investors without a single penny used to help these hospitals. Worse yet, this deal gives Optum, which has already bought up physician practices all across the country, a chance to buy an even bigger chunk of health care here in Massachusetts. Optum is already the largest employer of physicians in Massachusetts, counting more than 53,000 of our doctors in its network. And for comparison, Mass General Brigham has about 7,500 doctors. Now, Optum, with its more than 53,000 doctors, wants to get its hands on thousands more physicians in the Steward Group. The net result could be a disaster. Optum isn't offering to pay hundreds of millions of dollars so that they can make health care better in Massachusetts. Nope, this is all about making more money. And Optum has run this same play in other states. Optum boosts its profits by overbilling Medicare and cutting care for the patients who need it most. I do not understand how regulators can approve such a deal. I appreciate the work that Governor Healy and Secretary Walsh are doing to find a solution to a problem that they inherited. The blame for this crisis falls squarely on the private equity firm that bought the hospitals and stripped their assets and on Steward CEO Ralph Delatore, who sold the deal both to regulators and to the healthcare community here in Massachusetts. While we hold this hearing, Dr. Delatore is hiding out. Shame on Dr. Delatore. He owes the residents of Massachusetts an explanation for his part in looting steward hospitals. His refusal to appear at today's hearing is cowardly. We need accountability here, and law enforcement authorities should carefully review every aspect of this fiasco. We also need to change the law. Private equity should not be allowed to loot one business after another. And I have introduced the most comprehensive bill to overhaul the private equity industry. In addition, investors should face extra restrictions when they buy up hospitals and healthcare practices. And I have a bill to accomplish that as well. In the meantime, either of these laws could be put in place by our state legislature and protect the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This hearing is a good start, and I am grateful to Senator Markey for getting the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. And we're joined by uh, many healthcare leaders uh, uh, here in the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, Senator Cindy Friedman is here, Senator Mark Pacheco, Senator Mark, uh, Mike Brady, Representative Chris Flanagan, Representative Anna um, Howard, Representative Carol Doherty, Representative Jerry Cassidy, Representative John uh, Lawn, uh, Representative Sean Garbley. Um, we thank all of you for all of the work which you do on these issues on uh, a daily basis, and we're looking forward to uh, with uh, the federal delegation partnering with you in order to get the answers and find the solutions to this problem. So now we'll turn to our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Uh, Elena Stinson. Dr. Stinson is a board cer certified emergency room physician at Boston Medical Center. She also serves as president of the New England Medical Association uh, and as a Massachusetts delegate to the uh, American Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Stinson previously served as Associate 
medical director at the Reggie Lewis mass vaccination site in Roxbury at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. She earned her medical degree at Meharry Medical College, her master of public health with a focus on access to care in underserved communities from Harvard. And she has also received a master's in business administration from Babson College focusing on healthcare finance and her bachelor's of science, science degree from Spelman College. Um, Dr. Stinson, uh, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Markey, Senator Warren for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Elena Stinson. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician and have practiced medicine for 15 years. From 2013 to 2020, I was employed as an emergency medicine physician at Kearney Hospital and also worked at Good Samaritan and the former Quincy Hospital, all part of the Stewart Health System. In addition, over the past 11 years- Doctor, could you move the microphone just in a little bit closer? Yeah, please. <laughs> In addition, over the past 11 years, I have worked intermittently throughout the country at various facilities run and operated by HCA, Envision, Tenant, Team Health, and CHS. When I entered medicine, I deeply loved what I did, the caring for patients in the most vulnerable moments and working in a beautifully orchestrated chaos while bearing witness to many life-changing moments filled me with pride at the end of each shift. Unfortunately, so much of what I loved about emergency medicine has changed drastically over the years. Initially, my time at Kearney felt very fresh and fulfilling. Being able to serve very diverse population in Dorchester neighborhood of Boston was essentially how I always imagined my career trajectory, serving the most vulnerable populations. But when I could no longer f provide for my patients the way I would want my loved one, I had to make a decision to stay or go. Having spent time at several other Stewart Haas facilities, Briefly, I began to realize how resources were being bundled down and pulled from each facility. Most of the facilities no longer had certain specialty services, and Quincy Hospital eventually was taken down to bare bones before it ultimately closed. Not having blood products, respiratory therapy at times, or certain specialty services no longer felt like I was able to provide safe or quality care. What is happening here in the Commonwealth is happening all over the country. We have now seen the buyouts, uh, and m and led by private equity firms, over 30% of hospitals here in the U.S., and over 40% of emergency departments. Having spent time in other PE sites around the country, the level of deprivation was seemingly worse in some areas. Increasing wait times, critical shortage to sta of staff, leading to dangerous boarding levels and critical dangerous patient-to-nurse ratios in the emergency departments, seeing upwards to 14 to 1 ratios at times. All of this only to be exacerbated by the pandemic, which resulted in increased, increased cost of care, infection rates, mortality, and even death. Practicing medicine in PE-led places is no longer about patient safety or quality, but about making medical decisions and judgments due to corporate decision making with profit motives at the expense of patients. Forcing staff to see patients in waiting room in order to have it appear wait times were being reduced and improving door to dock time, calling codes on sepsis and stroke in order to find innovative ways to make profits through upcoding, increasingly daunting metrics required by physicians and other staff to meet were unattainable and unsafe in many instances, but very much expected. In addition, many sites across the country began to remove emergency physicians from in-network, resulting in higher bills for patients, known as surprise billing. This propagating practice not only harms patients, but also increases financial burdens on patients who do not have a choice where they go when they are experiencing that crushing chest pain or those stroke-like symptoms, especially when facilities sometimes are not close and you'll have to travel more than an hour away. Most of these facilities work I worked in very vulnerable populations that were mostly people of color, low income, and had limited access to other facilities or primary services, forcing them to only seek their care at a PE back site. It also known that most of these buyouts of hospitals and facilities are already struggling and have higher Medicaid and Medicare population, but ultimately affects our most vulnerable populations. It is critical we consider not only the impact that facilities have on our healthcare system, but also on the worsening care access and quality being provided to those communities already harmed by historical injury. The financialization of medicine will continue to exacerbate health disparities despite the work that we're doing on the ground to close these gaps. In addition, these private equity-backed facilities are where I typically ran into other physicians of color looking to serve the underserved communities. As it pertains to myself and my colleagues, these practices oftentimes felt unsafe, which sparked many questions of medical legal risk, as well as the emotional toll it took on all of us to enter into a profession to do no harm. In addition, being on staff at PE-backed facilities also would not qualify 
position swimming in student debt for loan forgiveness. A profession once competitive when I first began my medical journey is now one of the least competitive fields to enter as students bear witness to the destruction of the profession. In 2023, 554 of the residency spots went unfilled. We also saw more PE back hospitals opening residency programs that were not adequately equipped to provide the proper training for emergency medicine trainees. We train to do deal with hard stuff, but we are running out of options on how to continue providing safe and adequate care to our patients. Thank you, Dr. Um, Stinson. Next, we're gonna hear from um, Eileen O'Grady. She is the Healthcare Research and Campaigns Director for the Private Equity Shareholder Project. She has written extensively on the topic of private equity investments in the United States healthcare system. She's published nationally. Ms. O'Grady previously worked for Unite Here and the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Ms. O'Grady, thank you for being here today. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Sure. Thank you, Chairman Markey, and thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, I am Director of Healthcare Research at the Private Equity Stakeholder Project. We are a nonprofit watchdog organization dedicated to understanding the impacts, the increasing influence of private equity in our economy and its impact on people. Our mission is to empower communities, working families, and others impacted by private equity in the broader financial industry. And because private equity industry is so huge, those impacts are widely felt even if we don't always recognize when a private equity firm behind them. In fact, we've seen private equity investing in virtually every aspect of the healthcare industry, from buying up mental health and addiction treatment clinics to almost completely dominating the market for motorized wheelchair parts and supplies. As the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, we found that almost one in 10 private hospitals in the US are owned by a private equity firm. About a third of those hospitals serve rural communities and many of them are safety net hospitals serving, serving poor and uninsured patients. And this is really troubling because we have seen time and time again that the private equity business model, which is intensely focused on maximizing profit at all costs, is often at odds with providing quality care. We've seen that private equity's healthcare profiteering has resulted in dangerous conditions, declining quality, Medicare and Medicaid fraud, increased costs and closures. And those consequences have been borne by healthcare workers and the communities they serve. To better understand how this happens, it's important to understand the private equity business model in healthcare. Private equity firms are short-term investors. They usually try to own companies for around four to seven years. And during that time, they aim to generate as much cash flow as possible, often with a goal of doubling or tripling their investment. There are a few financial tactics central to this business model. The first is debt. Private equity firms routinely use much higher levels of debt than other companies, and they do it differently than I think a lot of people understand. Firms typically buy companies through leveraged buyouts, where a private equity firm finances a substantial part of the purchase price by taking out a loan secured by the company they're buying. And that means that the company is on the hook to pay down the debt that the PE firm took out. That kind of high leverage can divert cash away from operations to paying interest on the debt and leave companies more at risk for restructuring or bankruptcy. We're acutely seeing the effects of this now as private equity owned companies are struggling under mountains of debt in a high interest rate environment. We found that over 20% the healthcare bankruptcies that happened last year were at private equity owned companies. And 90% of the healthcare companies that are considered most at risk for bankruptcy now are owned by private equity firms. Bankruptcies in healthcare are more than just legal or financial events. They can lead to closures, disruption or cessation of critical healthcare services, layoffs, and those outcomes have ripple effects on the broader healthcare infrastructure, like overburdening healthcare providers that need to fill the gaps left by those closures. Another financial tactic we've seen private equity firms use with hospitals, sale leaseback transactions, where a private equity firm will sell a hospital's underlying real estate and lease it back from the new owner. PE firms will do this because it provides a quick and easy way to monetize uh, the real estate and generate cash for investors, but they often leave hospitals with higher monthly lease payments and beholden to a landlord. This is obviously the lesson we've learned with Steward Healthcare. There are a few other ways we've seen private equity firms blatantly extracting wealth from healthcare companies. Private equity firms have taken out new debt on the companies they own and then used the proceeds from that debt to give themselves a cash payout which is known as a dividend recapitalization. Somehow that kind of deal is completely legal. 
On top of all of these tactics, debt, stripping out real estate, extractive fees, dividends, we've seen private equity firms cutting costs. This might mean cutting staffing, skimping on medical supplies, failing to maintain equipment, cutting charity care. So I'm going to give you another example of how all of these financial strategies have played out at a hospital system. Prospect Medical Holdings is a safety net hospital chain that was for 10 years owned by a private equity firm called Leonard Green & Partners. Over the course of its ownership, Leonard Green loaded the hospitals with debt to pay itself hundreds of millions of dollars in dividends and fees. And then in order to pay down some of that debt, it sold off the hospital's real estate and leased it back, saddling it with expensive rent payments to a new hospital landlord. You might know the name, Medical Properties Trust, which now owns Stewart. All the while, its hospitals suffered atrocious conditions. Holes in the ceiling where the rain came through, failing to pay for medical supplies or gas for ambulances, uh, shuttered a hospital in San Antonio and sold the real estate to a luxury hotel developer. Uh, Leonard Green sold its stake, but now it appears Leonard Green's chickens are coming home to roost. Prospects hospitals are in poor financial shape, shutting down services, laying off hundreds of workers. Leonard Green, meanwhile, lined its pockets and left the communities Prospect serves holding the bag. I'm worried that what we've seen about private equities profiteering in healthcare is just the tip of the iceberg. It's been nearly impossible to hold private equity firms accountable, even when it's clear that their financial tactics harm patients and workers. And that's because private equity firms largely operate in the shadows. They rely on the fact that there is very little oversight over what they do. I want to be clear, we know the intense focus on profit isn't unique to private equity. We see this at all kinds of companies, including, unfortunately, at nonprofit providers. But private equity amplifies and exacerbates these kinds of extractive tendencies, and it gets away with it because complex corporate structures shield these firms from transparency and accountability. It's therefore critical for policymakers to pass legislation and for regulators to propose rules that increase transparency and accountability for corporate actors in healthcare. This hearing is a critical step for creating the tools necessary to shed light on the impacts of corporate healthcare profiteering and give stakeholders the tools to hold Wall Street accountable. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to your questions. And thank you so much for your, thank you so much for your testimony. Next, we're going to hear from Hannah Drummond. Ms. Drummond has been a registered nurse for over a decade and currently works in the emergency department at Mission Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. Ms. Drummond currently serves as Chief Nurse Representative for the National Nurses Organizing Committee and the National Nurses United. She organized her colleagues to the largest union victory at any non-union hospital in the South in almost 50 years. Ms. Drummond, thank you for being here today. Uh, you may proceed with your testimony. Can you turn on your microphone, please? Yes. Good morning, Chairman Markey and Senator Warren. Thank you for inviting me to testify at today's important hearing. My name is Hannah Drummond, and I am a registered nurse in the emergency department at Mission Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. I've been a nurse for over a decade, and I'm the chief nurse rep at Mission for National Nurses Organizing Committee, an affiliate of National Nurses United, the largest union and professional association of registered nurses in the country, representing 225,000 registered nurses. My reason for becoming a nurse is not unique. I want to heal people and provide quality health care to my community. I joined Mission because it was known for providing excellent care to residents of Asheville and considered the health care hub for Western North Carolina, which includes the rural Appalachian region. In the same year, our entire hospital system was bought out by HJ Healthcare, the largest health care corporation in the country. I quickly began seeing concerning changes in our hospital after HJ's purpose purchase. Every time I went into the supply closet, there were shoddier supplies that often didn't work. Hospital managers began cutting staff, including short staffing registered nurses to unsafe levels. When we brought these concerns to management, we were ignored. So we decided to organize our workplace to help protect our community. When we began our union organizing drive, we were met with an onslaught of union busting tactics from hospital management. This was happening in the midst of the COVID pandemic. The hospital was more focused on fighting the union than fighting COVID and protecting our workers. We had to fight to get the appropriate PPE and the federally required fit testing to ensure N95 respirators adequately protect individuals wearing them. 
Due to management's failure to provide fit tests to every healthcare worker, one of my nurse colleagues died. The pandemic exacerbated the issues nurses have been facing for decades, but the severe nurse staffing crisis we are experiencing now is due to the intentional policies and neglect of hospital management. Nurses are constantly directed to care for more patients with higher acuity and less staff and resources. Management's intentional short staffing is so pervasive that they refuse to staff the sterile processing department at Mission, which often means nurses and doctors in the operating room struggle to find sterile and safe equipment for surgery. There are decades of evidence to confirm that when registered nurses are forced to care for too many patients at one time, patients are at a higher risk of preventable medical errors, avoidable complications, falls and injuries, and death. I have seen patients die because they didn't receive the care they needed and deserved. HCA's staffing cuts have particularly impacted the emergency and oncology departments at Mission. And due to the closures of labor and delivery departments across the Mission hospital system, Anyone who needs to deliver their baby has to travel to Asheville, a drive upwards of two hours for some rural communities. My experience at Mission is representative of the decisions being made at HGA-owned hospitals across the country, which are being stripped of staff and essential services like nurseries, behavioral health, and trauma centers, leaving vulnerable communities without access to critical health services. This isn't just happening in HCA. Ascension, one of the nation's largest Catholic nonprofit healthcare systems, is using its market dominance to shut down its labor and delivery units. There are countless examples across the country that I could point to. Our profit-driven healthcare system is broken. Nurses know that you cannot serve the interests of profits and patients at the same time. Healthcare should not be a business. That's why nurses across this country support a single payer, Medicare for all system that will transform our profit driven healthcare system into one that prioritizes patient care. On behalf of the 225,000 registered nurses represented by National Nurses United, we urge the subcommittee to work with us to rein in profit-driven hospital corporations and private equity investors and build a sustainable, guaranteed healthcare system for all. Doing so is critical to improve working conditions in hospitals and the quality of patient care across the country. Thank you, Ms. Trellman, very much. And our, fi our final witness is Dr. Donald Berwick. Dr. Berwick is President Emeritus, Co-Founder and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Dr. Berwick, Berwick served as President Obama's Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under President Obama and on President Clinton's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection and Quality in the Healthcare Industry. Dr. Berwick serves as a lecturer at Harvard's Medical School Department of Healthcare uh, Policy, um, and he has served on the staffs of Boston Children's Hospital Medical Center, uh, Mass General's Hospital, and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So he brings a wealth of knowledge in our home state as to what is happening. So we thank you, Dr. Berwick, for being here. Whenever you're comfortable, please begin. Uh, thank you, Senator Markey and Senator Warren. It's really an honor uh, to be with you. I'm very grateful. I'd like to request that the full text of my remarks be on the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, I, I really want to speak first as a physician, a pediatrician. I, I trained for seven years to become a doctor, and one message was drilled into me every single day of my professional formation. That message is that the needs of the patient come first. I was taught to be proud of that commitment, and to let it become part of me, and it did. Uh, my career has wandered far from the bedside, but that imprint has never, has never left me. And I think that that principle, the needs of the patient come first, should apply to and be enforced by law in every single agent in the world of care, not just clinicians, but also organizations, 
payers, entrepreneurs, and investors. And at the moment, we are dropping that ball. The patient today, as you've heard from my colleagues on the panel, is at risk as never before in my memory, at risk of being demoted, forgotten, and harmed. And, and always, as always in America, it is people of disadvantage, marginalized, poor, who are at greatest risk. But make no mistake, the threat affects us all. We rank 69th among all nations in the world in our health and healthcare system performance, despite spending twice as much on health care as anyone else. That's an astonishing failure. The causes are many, but I think the cause we're focusing on today is a main one. It's this. We are uh, allowing the accumulation of wealth, not, not health, to become the aim, and that is causing harm at a phenomenal cost. Unchecked, and this is mostly unchecked so far, greed is going to cause disastrous and I think irreversible harm. The steward debacle is born of unleashing gaming and profiteering and greed among private equity investors whose aim is to accumulate wealth and whose method is to layer vulnerable healthcare organizations with debt and rental burdens too great to bear no matter what happens to patients and communities. The needs of the patient, far from coming first, are nowhere in sight. A steward is by no means alone in this, putting money above the healing mission, we see the unmoderated pursuit of wealth in drug prices, in hospital consolidation, and in Medicare Advantage, my own recent interest, where annual overpayments now amount to over $80 billion a year. And pointedly today, we see it in the behaviors of the majority of private equity investors whose sole aim is return on equity. They care little if that return comes from uh, peanut butter or health care. For them, it's the needs of the investor come first. And the evidence is accumulating, as you've heard, that private equity and private enterprise more generally, ownership of health care delivery brings harms to patient. We see it in autism care with significant declines in staffing and increases in use of cookie cutter care for kids that need customized care. Private equity ownership of nursing homes is associated with a 10% increase in mortality, 10%, lower patient mobi mobility and 11% increase in costs. After PE purchase of hospitals, avoidable patient injuries like falls and infections increase 25%. The power of money in politics makes it difficult to rein in this wealth accumulation like in the Stewart case because wealth has the power to stop statutory attempts to rein in wealth accumulation. It's a vicious cycle that requires exceptional political courage to reverse. If that courage were available, and you see it in this room in Senator Markey and Senator Warren, then we know at least where to begin to prevent other steward-like disasters and to restore patients' needs to the front of our priorities. We need statutory changes that allow, they have to allow private sources of capital to support authentic innovation in health and healthcare. We have to have capital formation, but that the, we have to preclude private equity entities and private enterprise, I think, from non-value-added ownership of healthcare delivery where they've typically relied on raising prices and decreasing costs, threatening adequacy and quality of care. We should forbid the typical private equity approach of loading healthcare organizations with debt, extracting capital, and leaving stripped down organizations at, in bankruptcy or worse. Uh, personally, I would forbid private equity firms from owning or controlling healthcare delivery. Uh, no, no, and no matter what, an entirely new level of transparency is called for, much as is contemplated in Senator Markey's uh, Health Not Wealth draft bill. That transparency must extend to real estate investment trusts that the private equity firms use to extract, uh, to free up cash for them to pocket. I would favor strengthening corporate practice of medicine restrictions. I commend Senator Warren for her proposed Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which would close many of the loopholes used in the private equity by the private equity players including unfair tax advantages. I would recommend that governance requirements change. Govern governance requirements change. I think 50% of directors of for-profit entities in healthcare should be unrelated to the investors and representative patients and communities. Uh, board meetings should be public. Um, I took oaths as a physician, and I believe those oaths should extend by law to organizations and investors who uh, want to get involved in healthcare. Uh, the needs of the patient have to come first. Thank you. Well,
Thank you, Dr. Berwick, so much. Um, and uh, adding to the list, we're, we're joined by Representative Kate Donahue, Representative Sam Montano, Representative Chris Worrell, um, Representative Estella Reyes, Representative Francisco Paulino, Representative Joan uh, Moschino, Representative Paul Donato, Representative Don Shand, Representative Dylan Fernandez, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. Uh, now we'll turn to uh, a round of questions. Uh, we'll have uh, a minimum of three rounds of questions for the panel. So. I've heard from healthcare workers at Stewart hospitals that they don't have tubes to draw blood or seeing their patient surgeries canceled because of unpaid vendors or understaffing. According to the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services, from 2022 to 2023, compared to the state average, more patients visiting Stewart hospitals in Massachusetts left emergency departments without care. Patients in need of mental health or psychiatric care stayed at the emergency department for 172 minutes, nearly three hours longer than the state average. At HCA Mission, uh, patients in the emergency departments are waiting for 16 hours. There are reports of a cancer patient waiting over 30 hours in the emergency department waiting for hospital admission. So, Dr. Stinson, what is the emotional impact of trying to provide care without the staff or the supplies that you need, knowing that corporate greed played a big role in the conditions that made it difficult to provide the care? Um, as you've probably heard from my other colleagues, we go into this profession to care for people. Uh, we all take an oath to do no harm. Um, when we're stripped of all of our resources and ability to provide the care that we've been trained to provide, it's a huge moral injury that a lot of my colleagues, including myself, have to bear. Um, seeing patients die in front of us with not having the proper equipment, um, seeing people in the waiting room having heart attacks or we can't get access to them quickly is a challenge and it and it strips us from our ability to to practice at the top of our license um, and these are traumas and injuries that live with us forever mr drummond how how, how does that resonate with your experience in the hospitals that you've worked Kid, again it really closely reflects dr stenson's um experience um, at my hospital specifically, we've seen a loss of our senior staff in both our physicians and our registered nurses. And when you get into the medical field, when I was a new nurse 10 years ago, it was so key to me to have my mentors to look forward to, to help process what was happening and to ask questions when I ran across something that I didn't have the knowledge to do on my own yet. Um, and what we see is high attrition rates across the board. We see nurses leave after just a year in the profession because they're being pushed out of their training faster, and then they're being put in charge of training other new nurses when they don't even have a year of experience yet under their belt. And it's not humanly possible to do that. And like Dr. Simpson said, it leads to moral injury. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Stinson, could you expand on how these for-profit hospitals interfere mm -hmm. in op operationally with the delivery of equity and justice, especially for black and brown and immigrant communities that are most in need of health care? That's a complex question. Um, but, I, you know, so there's so many different ways. I think the first thing that come that, you know, the first thing I, I think about when I hear that question is the removal of access to basic services, um, especially here in Boston, um, you know, how the city is set up. Um, once a specialty or service leaves a neighborhood, it's oftentimes challenging for people within a community to, to get the transportation to another facility that they can seek the care. So it oftentimes delays care in like cancer care or nephrology care or various specialties if they don't have it in their certain community or, 
or neighborhood. So one, delayed care, which leads to poor outcomes and widens those gaps in health disparities that I mentioned earlier. So communities of color typically are, are already disenfranchised and these facilities worsen those access to care and quality care issues. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Berwick, could you talk about that frame where this pressure to extract revenues out of for-profit hospitals that were seen in the Stewart case then ultimately wind up harming those who are the most vulnerable in the community? Well, the for-profit um, plan is charge as much as you can and spend as little as you can. And when clinicians are uh, forced to practice in conditions in which the resources are not there to support what they want in their hearts to do, it produces demoralization. And demoralization has all sorts of cascade effects uh, in terms of uh, longevity, uh, the, the, the relationships between doctors and patients. One other thing I will mention is that there's another cascade, and that's to the not-for-profit sector. When private equity and for-profit are establishing uh, behaviors around costs and profit that, that change the dynamics in a market, the not-for-profits are hurt. They have to, they, in fact, they have to follow suit. And so we're distorting the, uh, I think, the goodwill of not-for-profits to actually do the, do the, perform the mission. Okay, and let, let's just expand upon that for a second. When St. Elizabeth's and Kearney are in trouble in Boston, if they don't have the revenues to provide the services, that then impacts the remaining hospitals within the greater Boston area. Absolutely, it's one system and those patients end up going somewhere. But also when steward changes the rules, when they, when they, uh, when they uh, act in, um, in ways in cutting costs, for example, by, by reducing staff, that changes the market so that now you have the not-for-profits are in a market where they have to compete against those kinds of behaviors and it, it hurts it hurts their it hurts their commitment to patients also i also must say in governance in healthcare generally in the country if you look at the makeup of governance uh for profit or not for profit uh a recent study showed only 14% of the members of boards of large systems in this country have any have had anything to do with patient care they've never been near a patient 14% have been, have been near a patient. Who else is sitting in those seats? Guess what? Private equity, investors, real estate investors. So we're changing the whole game here through these behaviors, and it's got to stop. Instead of healthcare experts, you do have wealth care experts. Yeah, they think their the mission, day. and they're good-hearted people, but they think the mission is to accumulate. That's not the mission. The mission is to do whatever it takes to help patients, and so something's got to change. Thank you, Dr. Senator Warren. Thank you, Senator Markey. So I want to focus on another part of, of the, what's unfolding right now. Last week, after weeks of radio silence on Stewart's face, the news broke that United Health Group's subsidiary Optum plans to acquire Stewart's physician group, which is called Stewardship Health. Now, as far as anyone can tell, that is the last asset of any value left at Steward. The sale has been spun as a way out of the financial crisis for Steward's Massachusetts hospitals, but I'd like to take a closer look at that if we can. The deal is likely valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. So Dr. Berwick, is there anything in the deal as reported so far that requires Steward to put that money back into the Massachusetts hospitals? Uh, I don't know for sure, but not to my knowledge. Uh, they will be, it's another way to, 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 line, to line their pockets, okay. including uh, the, the purchase of the, by Optum, another for-profit, aggressive for-profit company worries me a lot. I, I don't know what's gonna happen to the culture of physicians. Okay, so we're talking about potentially millions of dollars going into Stewart's hands, but the money may not actually go into the hospitals. It could just roll right back out to another group of investors, like Dr. Delatore before, right? That is, that's my fear. Okay. Is there anything in this deal, Dr. Berwick, that would require Stewart to keep its Massachusetts hospitals open if the deal goes through? I don't know the content of the deal, but my, my guess is no. Um, and let me, one other th thing here is a lot of this we don't know. 
because both Stewart and Optum operate under conditions of lack of transparency that make it very, very difficult to know what's going on. So I'm going to put it this way. I think if it were beneficial for the hospitals or beneficial for the people of the Commonwealth, we'd hear about all of those elements. Instead, what we're hearing is that Stewart gets hundreds of millions of dollars full stop without any additional guarantee that a single penny of this money goes to the hospitals that need it and nothing to ensure that the hospitals stay open if this deal goes through. Once again, without oversight, this means the money can just blow out the door to the likes of Dr. Della Torre. Second, I want to focus on another part of this, though, and that is pause to think why a company would offer to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for the steward doctor practice group. One answer is that United Health is coming to, to town hunting for profits, not trying to figure out high quality care. So how do they think they're going to make tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in return on their investment? Remember, Earlier, the first private equity group that came in paid $246 million, evidently to the diocese, and reaped a benefit of $800 million. How are they planning to make money, tens of millions or hundreds of millions more, from the medical services that are already owned by the, that are already practiced by the Stewart doctors? Dr. Berwick? Again, transparency is a problem. We don't know the answer to that question because we lack we lack uh, access to the information of what's going on in Optum. My guess is they will raise prices. The, the increase, they'll increase physician fees. And, um, so they they'll drive up the cost. Right. They're going to charge everybody who comes in the door more, which means either the taxpayers, the insurance companies, or private individuals. And, right? Med and Medicare. They are absolutely the world's experts on upcoding. So uh, uh, they actually own companies for the purpose of upcoding. That's and, Optum. And, and just so everyone understands, upcoding means charging more. Right. Charging more in that case to Medicare, the government, and to beneficiaries. And uh, they, they have done that uh, all over the country, and I suspect we're going to see costs rise. All right. So part of it is going to be that they're going to, they're going to raise the cost of health care for everybody. In the Commonwealth, I want to ask you about another part, and that is the vertical integration. Optum is not a company just off on its own. It's related to another set of companies that are all trying to make profits. Can you talk just a little bit about that, Dr. Berwick? Well, Optum's, uh, I don't know Optum's plan inside, but they're buying up a lot of different components of healthcare, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, physician practices. And uh, so they're-, they're Billing vertically. practices, insurance companies. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So they, they, um, they're playing the whole game and they're experts again in price, in upcoding pricing. And, and why does it matter? when you have this kind of vertical integration. Why is that important? Well, you lose, you know, first of all, you don't have any market really at work. You have so deep concentration. So they're, they're, they're not accountable to anyone. And, so uh, every patient, every doctor who refers a patient to the hospital is already effectively tied to an entire group, right? So that everything has to stay in sync to maximize profits for the entire group. Is that a fair description, Dr. Burr? It could be. I, don't, I must say, in honesty, I don't really know what the deal is, whether they're requiring that kind of in-network uh, uh, okay, behavior. But they've got the opportunity they here do. of creating in-network Yeah, they, they, they're the largest control. employer of doctors in the nation. Over, I think it's they're probably approaching 100,000 now with this uh, purchase uh, at Stewart. That's a tremendous amount of heft in a market, so they kind of can call the shots. And there's the problem, right? It's a huge conglomerate that will have even more market power if it's able to buy the steward doctor practice. You know, we have a real problem with steward hospitals, but we need a solution, uh, not an opportunity to make things worse. We need to keep the doors open, we need to protect workers, and we need to provide quality care for our communities. A quick sale to another outside investor could do more harm here than good. Regulators let the original sale to private equity investors go through and permitted a nonprofit hospital that to become a for-profit corporation that answered to investors that were hungry for profits. 
Regulators put conditions on the sale, but the private equity firm found the loopholes, and we had a confluence of failures. As the Globe put it last week, regulators lacked the legal tools to hold Steward to account and were handcuffed by a fragmented oversight system and a lack of political will to take a tougher approach. So they stood by as more than a billion dollars in assets were quietly stripped out of the hospital system. Federal and state regulators should think once and think twice and think three times before they let another corporate investor suck more money out of the steward system. Thank you. <laughs> so let me, let me turn to you, uh, Ms. O'Grady. Uh, the private equity stakeholder project has done several reports uh, of instances of private equity firms hollowing out healthcare for profit. So please describe how these firms exploit a lack of transparency and complicated financial schemes to extract the maximum profit for their investors, but at the expense of the healthcare then provided at those hospitals. So can you walk through the scheme, walk through the play which is happening here in Massachusetts, but as you have studied it across the country? Yeah, there's very little transparency for private equity firms and, and particularly for the companies they own and their finances. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, private equity firms have, for example, extracted debt funded dividends and fees from the companies they own. And in most cases, they don't have to report that anywhere, uh, especially to the public. Um, so in, in my own research, I've been able to track down some of this information, but on a really piecemeal basis. Uh, so for example, um, one of the ways uh, that I've been able to dig into these finances is uh, when private equity firms uh, load their companies with debt, they uh, have to report that to, to the lenders and what they're going to use that debt for. Uh, credit rating agencies will then rate that debt. And so I'm able to at least get a glimpse into these companies' finances because they have to report this to another financial institution, the banks. So really, the, the only disclosures that, that I end up seeing are only available to me because they're meant to protect the banks. Uh, uh, you mentioned in, in your opening statement um, another hospital company, Pipeline Health, outside of Chicago. Uh, it was only revealed after Pipeline closed a hospital and filed for bankruptcy. In the bankruptcy filings, it was disclosed that it was owned by a group of private equity investors. And to make matters worse, they had been intending to close the hospital since before they purchased it. That was only available in the bankruptcy filings. So we we in a sort of perverse sense, got lucky that we were able to see that, uh, but it was all post-mortem, too late to do anything about it. Right. So going in, they would want you to think that if anything went wrong, it was because of benign neglect. We didn't want to really harm it one way or the other. But what you're saying is the plan is actually designed neglect. It's an actual financial plan to go in to strip out needed revenues uh, to provide services, uh, to privatize that wealth, and then to leave these institutions um, without the revenues, without the resources they need in order to provide services. So it's an actual plan that you can put on a three-by-five card out of business school in terms of what you should do. And it's one thing to do it to a widget company or a coffee company or to a, a muffler change company across the country. It's another thing to do it to a hospital that is central to the well-being of a community. And so from your perspective, what's, what's their mentality? Is it, as Dr. Berwick said, to just turn this entire area into one for financial profit uh, without any real regard for what the impact that is on hundreds and thousands and millions of families across our country? Yeah, I mean, like you said, health care over wealth care. But I think more broadly, I, it's important to understand that these aren't uh, 
I don't think that these investors are setting out to drive these companies into bankruptcy, is that their interests are misaligned and it is a, a broken business model that fully relies on extracting profit out of these hospital systems. They have everything to gain and very little to lose. Yeah, and, and thank you, Ms. O'Grady. And I saw you nodding your head, Dr. Berwick. And in response to Senator Warren's questions, you were saying, well, I can't be exactly specific because I don't know all the details as to what is going on. So can we really have accountability of corporate greed without greater transparency in this one sector, the healthcare sector, that affects every family in our country? I don't think we can. I served on the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission. Uh, Stewart refused to give the health uh, uh, in, uh, information agency the information. They just refused with no consequences that I could see. I don't know if that's changed since I was on the commission, but it, it was uh, no requirements to actually open, turn on the lights. Later, when uh, when Optum bought Atrius Health, uh, I felt there were some risks in that. And as a commissioner, I asked that we do a far deeper investigation to predict what would happen. We didn't, we couldn't. There was no information available, even on the, on the national effects of Optum purchase of physician practices. So the, this is a system that operates in the dark. And so we, uh, our hands are tied. So they kept the state of Massachusetts in the dark. They refused to provide the information necessary Stewart for the state did. to be able to make yeah again i don't know uh, what's an happened. accurate determination as to the financial condition of Stewart. yeah it just was no we won't uh, what's happened since i left the commission i can't say but that was what the situation then no i think it's all part of designed neglect i think it's all part of a plan for them to be able to continue to loot continue to drain the revenues out of the healthcare system, the steward system for personal gain, and meanwhile to hide the shenanigans, to hide the plot, to hide the scam which they have put in place. And so that's really what we're confronted with right now because of the lack of transparency, because of the lack of records that the state can have early on in order to prevent that cascading impact on the entire medical system. And that's my belief. Greed thrives in in uh, the dark, and uh, turning on the lights will help. And you agree with that, Ms. O'Grady? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, let me turn again to um, Senator Warren for another round of questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Markey. So let's spend some time talking about how we got here. Dr. Ralph Delatore, the CEO of Steward Healthcare, was invited to today's hearing as the head of the hospital system since 2006. Dr. Delatore has been involved in every major decision made by the company to sell off assets and leave behind a zombie hospital system. He is the number one person who needs to show up and account for what he has done. Failure to appear is cowardice. I appreciate our witnesses coming today. I hope we can unravel as much of this as possible, given that the hospital system has uh, been opaque and refused to follow the law in terms of its disclosures. But let's focus on a critical moment that brought us to today's crisis. It occurred in 2016 when Stewart's private equity owner, Cerebus, sold the land under its hospitals and its hospital buildings to a real estate investment trust, MPT. MPT paid one and a quarter billion dollars to buy those buildings, that land, the nurseries, the operating rooms, the, the parking lots, the whole thing. Dr. Stinson, you used to work at Kearney Hospital, one of the steward owned properties. When Cerebus sold Carney's hospital building, they got $260 million for that particular hospital's real estate. So did the workers get a raise in pay? Did working conditions improve? Um, uh, what, what benefits came to the hospital from that $260 billion, uh, million dollars? that they received? 
I did not receive any increase in pay other than what I negotiated, so no. Um, I can only speak for the emergency department. There were no infrastructure things that I saw going on. Um, I know the emergency department maybe got five extra ER rooms, but that was about it. All right, so you got five rooms it's a little with the curtains, right? These had doors. We got yeah. doors this time. Okay, got yeah, doors. We got doors. I, I, we I got stand doors. corrected. Okay. $260 million and you got five rooms, but no better working conditions for the staff. And the patients, did you see any evidence that Cerebus was reinvesting this money back in Carney in patient care? Not that I saw, no. Okay, so Cerebus sells, or Steward sells its hospital buildings for a total, for all of them they sold, more than a billion and a quarter dollars. And yet none of the money, or very little of the money, seems to have been used to support the doctors, the nurses, the other workers, patient care. Ms. O'Grady, if Cerebus didn't use this windfall to increase wages or invest money back into Stewart's hospitals, where did it go? It's a lot of money. Uh, it, it went to Cerberus. Uh, Almost $500 million went straight to Cerberus and its straight investors. Through. Yeah, mm -hmm. the rest of it was used to fund a rapid, massive expansion strategy by a steward. Okay, so it goes to investors, basically. It's where the money goes. And once the deal goes through and Cerebus has sold off stewards' buildings and land to MPT, where does that leave a hospital that doesn't own its own operating room and nursery and gift shop? So the, the hospitals were stuck with really hefty rent payments. They no longer had their most valuable asset. They were beholden to a corporate hospital landlord. By 2020, they were reporting an almost $400 million net loss. By the time Steward was ready to exit, or Cerberus was ready to exit Steward, they had made around $800 million dollars. In profit. In profits. That means gotten their in profit. Money no, they, back. they quadrupled their investment mm -hmm. on Steward. Fast forward to today, uh, Steward hospitals are in, in dire straits. So this is a prime example of the danger of private equity. The private equity firms walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars. They leave behind the shell of a business that often fails. It is a lot of conversation right now about people saying, well, but the hospitals were in trouble when they were first bought. Remember, the whole idea was Cerebus was going to come in and be a rescuer. However we evaluate what had happened to the hospitals back then, keep in mind, they had a billion and a quarter dollars drained out of them and still managed to keep providing patient care. If that money had stayed in the hospitals, if they had not had to pay the kind of rent that they had to pay after they lost access to all of their real estate, the financial condition of the steward hospitals today would be very different. We need to hold these executives accountable. We need to rein in private equity's influence over the healthcare system. And we need to make sure that we are providing the people who deliver health care with the resources they need to deliver that care for our patients. Thank you. Thank you. So um, have, did you ever, Dr. Stinson, in the hospitals in which you worked, ever see corporate executives held accountable for reducing health access at safety net hospitals? I never saw or witnessed that at all, no. Yeah, and, and I think that no resounds throughout the room in terms of this balance of power at, at corporate boards. Is there anything stopping Ms. O'Grady uh, Medical Properties Trust from continuing to buy hospital property or um, Cerebus from buying another hospital? No, not yet, anyway. But I think on a more positive note, we are seeing states across the country starting to consider legislation that would put more oversight over these kinds of transactions. And I think, you know, us being here today and your, your agenda uh, will also be a critical step at the federal level. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Strelman, did private equity exiting HCA stop them from understaffing the hospital and restricting access to trauma or cancer care? Absolutely not. I've only worked for HCA since they've been a publicly traded company. And at the end of the day, their number one priority is their shareholders and their profits, which is in direct, direct conflict with patient care. We are uh, the second most profitable hospital system in HCA across the country, and yet they refuse to staff us properly and give us the resources we need, and ultimately patients suffer and they die. So, uh, Dr. Berwick, um, this is a practice that private equity has that can be extended over to any part of the healthcare system, over to hospice care, nursing home care, over to fertility care, over to behavioral health care. Um, so can you expand upon what your greatest concerns are in terms of what this practice is today, but what it portends for the future uh, if equity, if private equity goes unchecked? Um, I think serious, serious damage to the mission and capability of healthcare systems. I defer to Ms. O'Grady for the particulars, but you're absolutely right. Private equity, and remember, private equity is only one form of private investment in healthcare. So we should be extending our view more toward uh, private entrepreneurship as the as an area of inquiry. But we know what happens. Nursing homes are now owned 70% by by private for-profit forces. Oh, the, the private equity share in nursing homes has gone down. It was 11% a few years ago. Now it's 7%. That doesn't mean that for-profit motive is left nursing homes. On the contrary, we have absolute clear scientific data showing deterioration in care with private ownership of nursing homes. They underperform in staffing. They underperform in patient outcomes and uh, higher costs. The same is true, as I've said, in autism care. I think it's, I think, uh, check me on it, it's over 90% of autism care is now privately owned, and it is all migrating toward decreasing staffing. Autism care depends a lot on customized, intensive intervention with kids, which does work when private equity gets control of autism care, that goes down. So you name the sector, and I, I don't personally have a single example of private equity ownership of any component of healthcare where the healthcare gets better. It just doesn't seem to be what happens. Yeah, so I think that what we've got on our hands right now is, um, is something that's only gonna grow as the years go by. Massachusetts is largely a nonprofit system, but Steward is the, um, is the beginning of something here in Massachusetts, but also across the whole country. It's an example that we have to learn from uh, because ultimately their collapse impacts the nonprofit healthcare system. And as they attempt to expand into other areas in the healthcare sector, it clearly would ultimately uh, wind up harming the nonprofit sector that provides the very same services. So corporate executives, they make profit, but when COVID hit, Massachusetts provided $54 million to Stewart during the COVID-19 pandemic. Pennsylvania provided $8 million to Stewart to prevent Easton Hospital from closing. And when for-profit hospitals drown, surrounding hospitals and community health centers have to pick up the slack. So, Dr. Stinson, what would what would it mean uh, for the patients you served at Stewart Kearney in Dorchester if that hospital cannot make it uh, without insurance without um, additional revenues that go into it. What would it mean for those people? I think this would be devastating. You know, I, I, I know there are a lot of hospitals around the city, um, but I think having easy access to care is critical to maintaining health of communities for generations. And when you remove a facility from a community, they no longer will maintain that ability to live prosperous lives, be able to contribute to the economy, um, continue to be um, 
you know, driving economic force in this commonwealth. Um, but in addition to that, it also would reduce employment opportunities for so many that live in the communities as well. Um, Stewart is a, a huge employer here. Um, and I think a lot of people that work in these communities in Dorchester and in Brockton would also lose employment and then also contribute in other ways that I don't think we fully realized. Okay. Um, Ms. Trumbull, what would it mean for the hospitals that you've worked in? As I stated in my testimony, Mission is the hub for Western North Carolina. So it would wreak havoc on our community. We are the only health system in Western North Carolina. There's a couple of other smaller hospitals, but as far as cardiac, neuro, and trauma emergencies, Mission's Hospital's campus is it. We're the only option. And so if we close our doors, there's nowhere for people to go. Nowhere. And Dr. Berwick, I'll give you um, the final word on that subject, the impact on patients. It's a cascade of effects, as you've, you've, as you've heard described. The, the, uh, I knew Mission, and Mission was an amazing uh, healthcare organization 20 years ago. So this is a real loss of a community as, as, uh, asset. And I think we can see that repeated over and over again. And one final comment on the not-for-profit. You're right, we're a not-for-profit system. But if there's a steward in town and they're cutting nurse ratios and they're cutting uh, resources and lowering their production costs and you're a not-for-profit, you've got, to, you've got to compete against that, which deteriorates, causes your own care to deteriorate. We are one system. And so you can't damage one component of it without seeing damage downstream. No, thank you. Um, thank you, doctor. And uh, we're, we're also joined by Representative Andy Vargas, Representative Jessica uh, Giannino, Representative Marjorie Decker, Representative Ryan Hamilton. Thank you all so much for your participation and your leadership. Let me turn again to Senator Warren. Thank you very much. And Ms. Drummond, I just want to say you really – hit it exactly right when you said there's nowhere else to go. Um, we need these hospitals and we need them to be open and functioning uh, and functioning at a high level. People need this care. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you for the work that all of our healthcare professionals do. Let's talk for just a minute as we wrap this up about changes we could make in the law so this doesn't happen again. Um, the first one I want to start with is I've got a, a general uh, law to deal with private equity. It's called the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, and it's the most comprehensive legislation to fundamentally reform the private equity industry. It would make private equity funds liable for the debt that they saddle on portfolio companies. It would ban dividends to investors after a firm is acquired, and it would protect workers in the bankruptcy process if the, the target company eventually fails. Uh, it also deals with some of the tax breaks right now, where taxpayers are subsidizing private equity, which is a terrible mistake. But tell me, Ms. O'Grady, how might the steward crisis have turned out differently if these provisions had been enacted? I, I think it would have been completely different. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, the concept of joint liability. Uh, so right now, private equity funds are structured in a way that they are completely protected from the liabilities of the companies they own, which makes them take on incredible risks that they don't have to pay the price for. They, they get away with so much with impunity because they are not liable for the companies they own. And so I think just by one example, the Stop Wall Street Looting Act's joint liability provisions would create actual accountability for that kind of corporate profiteering. Okay, so this is not a case where we just have to throw up our hands and say there's nothing we can do about this. We can change the rules. We can put some regulations in place and stop this kind of looting. I would argue, though, that it's not enough just to do it across the board. We need special protections in healthcare because we are literally talking about life and death. We are talking about hospitals that we cannot let close. So let's talk about that for just a second. Steward is in shambles. Uh, 
but its private equity owners walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars in profits, 400 million from the sale lease back alone. And Dr. Delatore refuses to tell us how much he's made off the deal, but at least it was enough to support a couple of yachts. Um, <laughs> Ms. O'Grady, does the federal government have any authority to claw back the profits Dr. Delatore or the private equity executives made from selling Steward Hospital's assets out from underneath them and then hollowing out the hospitals while they ran away with the profits? No, not that I know of, but it, it should. But it should. And that's, that's really the point here. So I am also introducing new legislation to change that. And I, I want to make the point, there are two things it would do. It would ban health entities that receive federal funding from selling or mortgaging their assets to real estate investment trusts so that Wall Street investors can no longer strip hospitals of their land and property and operating rooms and nurseries. We need to put an end to that, and we can. And second, it would give the federal government new authority to claw back compensation from both the healthcare executives and Wall Street investors whose predatory financial engineering endangers the viability of a hospital. The potential collapse of steward healthcare threatens access to healthcare for communities all across our Commonwealth. The first thing we need to do is to keep those hospitals open and able to deliver high quality care. We also need to hold these executives accountable though, because failure to do so now just invites them to come back and do this to another part of the healthcare system and another part of the healthcare system and another part of the healthcare system. The fact that this happens is because of choices that we have made. We have failed to step up and change the law to protect the delivery of health care system in America. It is now on us to make those changes. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Uh, 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 do, you, do, you have a, do you have a concluding statement? Beautiful. So thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone who has uh, joined us today. Uh, we heard clearly that the steward health care crisis is the rule and not the exception. Whatever the financial strategy or company type, patients and communities suffer when companies freely put corporate greed over community need. Frustratingly, our system allows even rewards this strategy. Private equity companies across the country are quietly making profits while infiltrating everything from fertility care to hospice care. HCA Healthcare made $65 billion, billion in revenues last year. Cerebus walked away from Steward with over $800 million in profit. Medical Property Trust CEO reported in February that the land they own from Steward would start making them money again soon. But that money will not be going to the healthcare system. And meanwhile, it is communities that continue to experience the consequences. And without reform, we simply risk trading one problem for another. Instead of private equity cutting deals, we have Optum exerting its potentially monopolistic power over our healthcare system by buying Steward's physician practice group. Like the Hydra, cut one for-profit company's head off and more will take its place. We need to change our strategy. And that's what I'm proposing in a path forward. We need a health care system for everyone, supported by Medicare for all. And the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal for health care. We need to continue aggressive oversight on corporate greed. I was on the committee in 2000 and Nine. We fought, we fought, but we could not get the votes for a single-payer system.
But we know that ultimately that was the flaw in the Affordable Care Act that we did not have in that provision. And we need the Health Over Wealth Act to require protections for patients and providers, transparency from corporate executives, and accountability from companies that put their wealth over America's health. The discussion draft for that bill that I'm introducing um, is posted at markey.senate.gov health over wealth. Fighting against corporate greed is going to be an uphill battle, but it's what Senator Warren and I are promising you here today that we are going to conduct on a national basis. And it's uh, what we've seen in the face of the steward crisis that is uniting people in the face of the greed which we can see here in our home state. Doctors, nurses, lab techs, hospital administrators, professors, advocates, and elected officials are all saying clearly it is long past time to make sure patient health comes before shareholder wealth in Massachusetts and across our country. And before we close, I would like to thank the many stakeholders and experts who contributed to this hearing. The Massachusetts Health Policy Commission, the Center for Health Information and Analysis, uh, Dr. Uh, Zero Song, uh, Rosemary Bat, Public Citizen, the American Federation of Teachers, Americans for Financial Reform, National Nurses United, Mass Care, and the many, many Massachusetts elected leaders, health providers, and experts who have made their voices heard through conversations with me, with my staff, and through written testimony, which will all be put into the Senate permanent record. And on that note, I ask unanimous consent to enter uh, into the record 23 statements from stakeholders outlining priorities regarding reducing the harms of for-profit uh, entities, including private equity in our healthcare system, without objection so ordered. And finally, we want to thank our esteemed witnesses today. You did a fantastic job. Your testimony Your testimony today and the events at Steward and HCA facilities that necessitated your participation are a stark reminder that we owe it to our patients in Massachusetts and across the country to not only learn from you, but to act. So we'll leave the record open for any other senators who wish to act, ask questions. The record would be open until April 17th of this year. Uh, we thank you. We thank everyone who has participated in this. We Failure is not an option. We have to fix the system. We have to protect it against the predators uh, who are looking at this uh, health care system as just another way of making themselves more wealthy. But again, it will come at the expense of the health of ordinary families. We thank all of you for, for your um, participation today. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all so much.